Cannabis investment. Everybody, please uh, take take a seat. We'd like to start this on time. Matt. Okay. We'll wait for Matt here. <laughs> And making his grand entrance, Matthew North. <laughs> oh, there are stairs over here, by the way. Oh, there are. <laughs> <laughs> I went the other round. That was my fault. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mitch Berman. I'm your moderator for the panel on cannabis investment. You may ask, what the hell am I doing up here? All right, who the hell am I? Um, uh, you know, I was telling my son the other day, who was in a panel here on over-the-top streaming video services, that when you're the young person, you actually get to sit as, mo as a, a panelist, Mitch. <laughs> and when you're the older guy, you're a moderator. So that's, that's my world these days. So I'm an ex-digital uh, uh, media guy, and I say ex because I, I don't work in a big corporation anymore. I'm investor, strategic advisor to a bunch of digital companies all over Southern California. And I fell into uh, an opportunity to start a video service called, if you look in your program guides, 420 TV. And the idea behind this is all about the cannabis culture and giving the cannabis culture a destination uh, that's high quality, HBO-ish, which is where I come from in my younger days, something that uh, would be, be very engaging to that community. And through my experience doing this, because this is all a new world to me, um, it is, uh, we're, we're clearly at a time, a moment in time, where uh, this new world this is, is a burgeoning industry, a legitimate industry, that is just about to take off. It's taking off with an ING. And so uh, what we have here today is a group of guys who are heavily involved in the investment in that new direction, that new industry. And I think what they have to say will be very interesting to you. I'm going to ask them uh, uh, several leading questions. And uh, if we have some time at the end, because we only have 45 minutes, you know, I'll open up to Q&A to the audience. But for right now, let's get, let's get started with this, what I call the wild, wild west of cannabis investment. And it's wild because these guys uh, are at the beginning of this new industry. It's a small community. And one day it's not going to be small anymore. It's going to be huge, at least in my opinion. I'm witnessing it. I'm watching it. So with all that being said, let's meet our panelists, uh, if you guys would take turns, Mitch, you can start, and tell, tell the uh, two things. One is tell them what you're doing now, who you are, and second, just an overview statement on how you see this burgeoning industry from sure. your perspective. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so uh, my name is Mitch Kulik. Um, I'm a <coughs> lawyer. Uh, I, tell, I tell everybody I'm a cannabis lawyer, uh, which didn't exist a couple of years ago. Uh, I've been a lawyer at a big firm. I was a lawyer at uh, the Securities and, Securities and Exchange Commission. Then I was a lawyer at a private equity fund and a hedge fund in New York City. And around 2013, I saw what was happening in the cannabis industry and, and really, uh, you know, I've always believed it should be legalized and regulated uh, like any other product. So I saw an opportunity. Uh, and I really believe that the lab space at that time, to me, was a, was a perfect point of entry into, uh, into the industry. It felt sort of you know, quasi-governmental, quasi-regulatory, and somewhat um, you know, a, a sort of a legitimate way to come into the industry. Hard to just, at that moment in time, to enter and become a, a grower, per se. So uh, I, I went around uh, the, the west coast of the country and met a bunch of people in the lab laboratory space. Uh, that's, Laboratories like uh, you know, quality assurance testing, uh, telling you about potency and heavy metals and pesticides. And uh, I met the folks at Steep Hill Labs, which back then no one really knew about, but I suspect most people in the room would have heard of Steep Hill Labs, maybe if you're in the cannabis space, uh, and became their general counsel. 
but shortly after joining Steep Hill, uh, I realized that the, in addition to really high quality scientists and operators, what, what uh, Steep Hill and a lot of other companies in the industry needed was uh, startup capital. So I started to help Steep Hill uh, raise money. <coughs> and, um, you know, and I discovered that I was actually good at that if I believed in what I was um, raising money for. Uh, and so after about three years of working at Steep Hill, uh, I was working primarily for Sweat Equity. Uh, I decided to start my own firm uh, in New York, a law firm to represent cannabis companies, which is, a, people were saying to me at the time, why would you do that in New York? It doesn't, the, per, the cannabis doesn't really exist in New York like it does out here. Uh, and that's true, that's changing, though. You should all know in California, uh, I should be proud that this movement has made its way out to the East Coast. Uh, in about a month from now, we'll have adult use uh, in Massachusetts, which is a pretty big deal. And, uh, and there's lots of movements. New Jersey is moving very uh, quickly forward towards adult use, as is Connecticut, and New York is not, not too far behind. But the reason why I really, I had an idea to stay in New York, which was from my hedge fund experience that there was, uh, I had, I knew people who were investors. And, uh, and it's actually kind of worked out, not exactly as I planned, but, but pretty, pretty much along those lines where uh, people in New York read the New York Times. And the New York Times runs an article almost every day about the cannabis space, but they don't know how to find cannabis deals in New York. It's, that's changing, but a couple of years ago they didn't. And so I'm representing companies, but then also helping them uh, you know, make some introductions to some of my clients who are, uh, so I have clients who are companies. That, that need partnership agreements, that need capital markets agreements and advice. And I have other clients who want uh, diligence on those companies. And so after I will do a diligence on, on certain companies, then those investors might say, well, what other companies are you representing? You know, that maybe we can come in and meet with them. So it's actually, it's a really uh, unique, uh, interesting place uh, to be. And uh, I, I think, I don't know if I answered both your questions there, but maybe I did. But where I see the industry going, I think was your second question is, um, it's going like, it's going to be huge, and it's going to, and it's going quick. It's going too, in my opinion, from my perspective, it's going too quickly because I, I'm having a lot of fun what I'm doing, uh, and I don't know that I'll be able to do what I'm doing in two or three years when all of the private equity funds and all of the alcohol and, and everybody comes in. I get to do what I do now, and hopefully I'll have built a footprint so that, and the reputation that'll uh, carry me forward. But uh, you know, the the fact that these companies can't get traditional financing and can't get, you know, some lawyers won't represent cannabis companies. My old firm, Greenberg Traurig, that hired Rudolph Giuliani will not represent <laughs> cannabis companies. All right, luckily they also got rid of them, but they still won't represent cannabis companies. At least that's their official uh, stance, although I see them all over the place uh, in the industry. But so, uh, anyway, I'm a big believer in the industry, I'm a big believer in the plant, and I'm a big believer in the fact that people should be able to uh, you know, if you're over 21, you should be able to make your choices and have uh, access to a safe product. And, uh, and I think that uh, it's, I, maybe later on I'll tell you, I can think of 10 things that have happened in the last three or four weeks that are pretty convincing that the toothpaste is out of the tube and uh, the industry is moving at, uh, at you know, breakneck speed. Great. John? Yeah, I thought it was the trains out of the station. Is it Train, toothpaste? Toothpaste out of the tube, okay. trains out of the station. All right. Where Everybody's got to add there, hey. going down the, uh, the aisle. <laughs> so hi, uh, John Traubin. I'm a partner in Altitude Investment Management. We're a New York-based investment firm focused uh, solely on the cannabis industry. The firm was created last year, and we have uh, raised and continue to raise capital for our debut fund. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the firm is, uh, has four partners, as, as I said. Um, we really define ourselves as it's a mature group of, of long term institutional investment management uh, professionals. And I say mature more from an age perspective, not, not from a quality perspective. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, uh, so, so the firm to date has invested in 13 companies across the industry, plant touching um, through the services economy, HR payroll, data analytics, um, uh, seed to sale software tracking. So you know, there, there's a part of the industry that is really about, I call foundational or the plumbing of the industry. Uh, and then there's the other side of the ledger, the plant touching, which is the, all the activities that are licensed, cultivators, brands, retailing. Uh, we're really excited about the industry and the opportunities, uh, really on a global basis, because the reality is this is a global industry. Um, 
I'm New York based. I, you know, when I, whenever I come to the West Coast, and specifically LA, um, you know, it has its own dynamics, and there's a there's a uh, there's a group and a culture here that um, I, th I think kind of lives within the Southern Southern California ecosystem. Uh, but the reality is, think bigger. This is really a global industry, and Altitude's focus is to find great investment opportunities, invest in great management teams, help the companies grow. Uh, and uh, provide a great return for our investors. Thanks. Hey, Sean. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, Matt Norgren, <coughs> um, Two Face out of the tube, train, train left the station. Good. Genie left the, is out of the bottle. <laughs> Be tougher for you to find Not another one. Uh, yeah. Um, shout out to 420 TV, by the way. If you haven't downloaded it, awesome. Um, Thank you. Yeah, man. really cool. Thanks. You should download that. It's on your app. Uh, Matt Norgren with Arcadian. Um, we're a fund, uh, an investment vehicle. We're also an advisory group and uh, an investment bank. Uh, really, our specialty is growth equity uh, in this space. We sort of look for A and B rounds, companies that are best in breed. Our specialty is being in LA and thinking we can help companies in this market um, in particular. Um, uh, we are uh, uh, born out of a family office, so we really do think as pr like private equity guys. And I'm um, just very happy to be here with all of you today. I'll keep mine fairly short. Uh, Evan Eneman, I work across the industry in a few different ways. Um, founding partner of Casa Verde Capital. We're an early stage venture firm focusing on ancillary opportunities in the space. So the infrastructure, media, anything that's non-plant touching. Uh, I also run a services firm called Ello, which is more from an advisory standpoint. Uh, supporting operators uh, with compliance, risk, uh, capital markets advisory services, tax services, given the complications of the industry today, uh, and also a uh, creative agency called Fiorello, which focuses more around brand development, uh, marketing, and PR. Okay. Thanks, Ev. So uh, about three weeks ago, I was uh, invited to tour the fifth largest grower in the United States out in Pahrump, Nevada. And while I was getting the tour, uh, we went in the back office where the gentleman who owns the facility sat down with me. We were talking about 420 TV and some other things. And uh, Two women burst into his office and said, uh, hey, Howard, we need uh, $3,000 to pay one of our vendors. I was sitting there in, in watching this scene, uh, and uh, Howard looked at me and he said, Mitch, would you mind? I'm going to help these ladies out. And I said, go ahead. There was a huge safe in the back of, of this room that I was sitting in. I saw it there when I first came in. Well, he opens this safe, and there was stacks of $100,000 bills. I know there was millions in the safe. He reached in and took out what he called a brick, he counted out $3,000, handed it to his assistant, and they took off. Guys, with uh, you know, the regulations up in the air, with the banks uh, not sticking their toes in this water, as investors, uh, how do you see this world uh, moving forward when the banks are not supporting the industry? I know that I've heard that there are a couple of banks that are specifically targeting mar uh, marijuana, cannabis, uh, banking. But from your perspective as investors, how do you see this world that's very cash focused right now because it has to be? Anybody? I I'll take that. Let Go me ahead, start. John. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> I, I, view, I view the banking issue. Uh, in the context of a lot of issues that create friction and illiquidity for the uh, for the industry, um, which create uh, part of which creates investment opportunity for everybody at this table. So um, we all want it to be fixed, and I think everybody in this table will tell you at some point it will get resolved. Um, but it's part and parcel of the opportunity. So if you're uncomfortable with it, you won't find the right. Uh, you won't wrap your head around making an investment in this industry. Uh, but if you can uh, understand it and project where you believe it's going to go, uh, it in fact creates the opportunity. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, you know, my view is the banking issue will get solved well before prohibition recedes and goes away. Um, it, it can be truly the source of, of state-based banks or credit unions 
ultimately, the money center banks will own this industry um, to a large degree. Uh, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a moment in time and a matter of time before it's resolved. It's an uncomfortable situation. It's getting a little better every day, and then it takes a half step back. So it, it, it's one example of, of the, uh, the problems and the frictions uh, of the industry. But, but in a way, embrace it because it creates the opportunity. Point, John. Um, I think you also have to think about uh, if you're uh, in the plant touching business or if you're in non-plant touching. I think the non-plant touching businesses have a little bit easier time with it. Um, I think all of our companies, which we're in the non-plant touching business, have fully disclosed uh, business plans with their banks, and um, I think only a couple have had banking issues. Um, you can still have them, so. Uh, definitely more of an issue if you're, a, you know, carrying a license um, that your state provides, that there's no federal body with which to provide that license, which means you have no ability to have the FDIC insurance backing your bank uh, in banking needs. So that's, uh, that's one way to differentiate it. But look, I mean, um, Mnuchin's been very clear recently that he has an appetite to get this figured out. Um, Steve Mnuchin. So I think that we're being heard. It does get a little better every day, but it's certainly an issue. Um, and then you have a lot of great folks looking at uh, state banks and credit union uh, initiatives. One in particular is, is that's being sort of in the works now. I don't know where it is, but uh, a, a, a banker's bank that will effectively be um, a bank that banks the other banks that do business in this space that do that will end up having FDIC insurance. So uh, I think you're seeing a lot of smart people that are trying to solve this issue, but I think it's only a matter of time before the banks bank it anyways. And um, and uh, maybe that's two years out, three years out. Right. And I, I just would would add it is it's it has you read about it, and it but it really is a challenge to the industry. But um, you know, there's, we're making this distinction between you know plant touching and, and non-plant touching, which, from a, from my perspective, is sort of a legal fiction. I don't really buy into it so so greatly. But um, the licensed, what the, what these gentlemen said, right, is that the licensed entities are the ones that are plant touching and are having the biggest problems. But what's interesting is those licensed entities that are the ones that have to deal with state compliant reporting systems. So, like from an investment perspective, as an investor, you can feel pretty comfortable that you understand how what's going on at the business um, and where the money is going because you know there's a, there's a pretty easy way to track it you know uh, one of our clients is a dispensary in LA and they're on a system and you can see which are their credit receipts and which are their cash receipts and you know they have systems in place that they um, that they they use to manage their cash and, and when you're applying for a license it, you have to sort of explain your processes and your SOPs for handling cash and how it's being picked up by armored cars and et cetera, you know, um, and that's how you, that's how you win a license to be, to sort of, to begin with. So it is a problem, but from an investment perspective, it's not like you're necessarily nervous that because it's, there's a significant cash component that it's hard to track. It's, it's, you know, these license entities are actually required to, to, uh, to track their, their cash flows and sales. Yeah, I'll just add um, a comment. I mean, certainly if the banks are not supporting it, their bankers are in many ways. So I think that in and of itself will have to resolve at some point soon. But also, you know, it kind of gives us an opportunity to actually solve challenges that are not just within the cannabis industry, but just in general in um, financial services and transactions. And, and we're seeing a lot of really interesting technology emerge built on blockchain that creates frictionless commerce, um, smart contracts, uh, you know, transfer of information that becomes immutable and fully transparent. And so from a regulatory standpoint, that provides a lot of support for this industry and the issues that we've had. And, and so yes, the cash issue today is a problem, but I think it's also giving us a platform to solve these types of challenges that we have in, in many industries. And, um, you know, there's, uh, I wouldn't say, any immediate issues that we're seeing in at least in California and some other markets where you do have uh, you know state charter banks or, or um, you know other local community banks that are supporting the industry it just becomes a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more challenging from a, a risk standpoint but still something that uh, you can do whether through cash handling procedures and SOPs 
um, or finding other creative ways to uh, you know, transfer uh, value. I find it very interesting is um, I move about in the cannabis world now because of 420 TV. Uh, the viewpoints of my friends and uh, business colleagues, uh, it really runs the gamut. It is really ex uh, one extreme to another. In my opinion, uh, cannabis is becoming mainstream. Um, when I did my research as to how large the audience was for uh, this service, 420 TV, uh, it was in the millions. And it's not just USA, it's worldwide. At least for those you know, who admit to smoking it. But the fact is, it's not just used for smoking, there's medicinal uses as well. And what was very interesting, uh, and I'm uh, about to ask you guys a big old question here, I'm setting it up. Um, Facebook shut down 420 TV's initial marketing of a show that we have called Medical Marijuana Miracles, which is a, it's basically a, a documentary on humans, men, women, children, who are using uh, cannabis for treatment. Um, and they uh, told the heads of 420 TV that it was false advertising, and they had to shut, it, shut down the marketing for it. If, in fact, we are at a point in time where this is now a mainstream product, and I say it that way, um, how do you guys see the advertising aspects of that? And Matt, you know, I'm going to call on you because I know that you're involved with High Times Magazine. Um, because uh, the reason I'm asking the question is, on the, on the service we've got now, we've, we're advertising for the first time all kinds of cannabis products that in the ads themselves are entertaining because these are things you've never seen before. But there are other mainstream advertisers and brands who won't get near it at this time. And I put quotes around at this time. What is everybody waiting for? What, what, what's the issues you see it? And one, Matt, why don't you take that from the aspect of you, you have a magazine, you have brands that are advertising in that magazine. Talk to that. Yeah, and I saw Adam Levin here earlier, who's our CEO, and uh, I don't think he's in the room right now, but um, it's, it's been great for us because there's not a lot of outlets right now for you to go to to get exposure for your brand or your business in the space. You have Facebook, Google, can't go you know, hire a big celebrity to support your brand on a nationwide commercial. I mean, it's really limiting, and I think that's changing. Um, you know, from an issue, from we we haven't had a lot of issues on our side, to be honest, because we let everybody that can't find uh, opportunities elsewhere uh, on our platform. Um, I might ask Evan actually uh, with some of the brands you're involved with, and I know you have you're involved with Candescent. You know, uh, maybe from a brand side, you guys might have a little more perspective as far as where you can and can't go. Yeah, you know, I, I I'll answer in the bigger picture, which is um, I. You know, the, the ability to advertise, to uh, build brand, influence your customer um, is, uh, is limited because of prohibition, right? And it creates, again, the opportunity. It's, it's such, a, such a tight channel, and limited channel, uh, that brand products and services uh, can use to reach their customer. Uh, and so it, it's a big focus for our firm. Mm -hmm. we, we have some investments on that space. Um, I find the digital ad network side of the equation really interesting and really any way any platform that enables products, brands, and services to reach and influence their customer. Uh, you know, Candescent is one of our investments. It's a good example. Uh, you know, they can't buy AdWords, uh, and um, and uh, you know, a lot of what you see on uh, on Instagram and the others are social influencers, and there's a limitation to that. So you know, it's a it's an interesting problem, and there's interesting solutions that come about. Uh, but what it really means is these limited channels of a distribution to reach the customer will have a lot of value. And I, and I also think in the longer term, cannabis will be one of the most restricted products to advertise to the consumer, more than alcohol, more than pharma, more than tobacco. Um, it shouldn't be any easier than those things. And uh, so if you can find great channels to reach the customer, they should have real value. You know, High Times is certainly one of them uh, as a platform that gets tremendous amount of uh, web traffic and, and other traffic through the events that uh, the, pl the, uh, the company does. Uh, but, but it's a real interesting focus. But again, it's prohibition creates these interesting opportunities if you can navigate it. Are you advertising with us yes, yet? Or? Uh, is Candescent? I'm not sure. OK. 
Okay, let's follow up on that. Uh, I'll talk to uh, Evan has a couple of those as well, Mary Jane. And <laughs> yeah, I think the thing I'll add there is, um, you know, advertising is a, is a fairly broad topic and, and may have restrictions now, but essentially uh, you're creating an experience and that isn't necessarily, um, you know, limited to a digital platform that currently is not allowing for an advertisement. And so more importantly for a brand is what is that experience that you're creating? What, what are you trying to have a consumer feel and have an emotional tie to your brand, which is typically not digital in many ways, at least not in a consumer product. So getting off of digital platforms right now is really important. Getting into creating experiences that help inform consumers about what that brand is really all about, um, which hopefully is not just a product. And if it is, then you can have a long way to go as real brands enter the space so you know th there are some limitations you know you can go through you know media platforms that are supportive of the industry and, and want to help tell that story but i would say right now that the big focus that that we work with our uh, clients on and, and many other brands is you know get off the digital platforms take people off their phones and bring them in immersive experiences and, and then use that content that you capture to, to sort of bring those consumers through that experience over time and, and make that uh, usable content that you can introduce others to. Um, that's really the best way that we've seen work so far. You know, I, I, I just look at that. That is, um, it's the right way to do it in a limited environment. Ultimately, you know, so that's a very successful channel to do it. Uh, but I also think as the industry matures and the channels open up a little more, uh, cannabis industry from an operational basis or from, from, from the advertising side won't be too different from uh, many other industries. It's being forced to create these new channels um, and it'll morph, you know, it, it'll, it'll create some interesting um, uh, paradigms in the, in the way to think about how you grow from there. Uh, but, but I also think, don't think the cannabis, in my view, don't think the cannabis industry is going gonna, is gonna to operate very different from many other industries. It will ultimately settle down and operate very familiar to uh, all the other products and services uh, we buy and are influenced by, but you got to be creative yep. at this stage to build up that brand recognition uh, and the uh, the experience with the customer for sure. Right, because I mean it sort of goes without saying, but I'll say it nonetheless. It's a controlled one. It's a schedule one controlled substance. So you can't advertise. You could, you know, your con your question was you had this video talking about medicinal benefits. I suspect that there's medicinal benefits to LSD and heroin, yeah. but you can't advertise for those things. Um, What's interesting is that, so I, was, I said before, there's like 10 things that are on my mind that, that took place over the last 30 days that would show the acceleration of the industry. Uh, two weeks ago, the FDA voted 13 to 0 to approve the extraction of CBD, which is a, control, a Schedule One controlled substance, um, at, to be used uh, on children for epileptic seizures. Um, so on some level, you, you can't have the federal government at the FDA saying it is medicinal and then leaving it on the schedule. It's that, the qualifications of which are, has no medicinal value and a high likelihood of abuse. So if your video is focused on CBD, I'd say, you know, don't put it on the shelf just yet because, you know, that's, there's probably a rescheduling or descheduling coming for that component of the plant. Uh, maybe not THC just yet, but, uh, and until it does, you know, I, I think you're going to find you know, Facebook and Google are not going to be friendly, you know, recipients, particularly, I suspect, did this, did this happen after Facebook had its, uh, you know, recent issues, or did you get pulled before? It was, it was, it was prior. It, prior. Was, it okay. was just a promotion of the show that was depicting individual right. humans that were, it was their human story. They didn't right. want us to do that. Right. That's I think what way. else is important to point out is how uh, the future of this industry looks, and I think when you... Uh, talk about the bioscience aspect of this and deconstructing the plant at the molecular level and reconstructing it. That ultimately drives brands, I think, but ultimately each one of those new formulas will be regulated independently, right? Is it a medical product? Is it an over-the-counter product? Is it a recreational product? Because if it's a nutraceutical and it's, you know, some cannabinoid compound that we haven't studied much yet that has no psychoactive effect but is great in the topical receptors and pretty much is safe and has zero downside, a different product than Epidiolex with GW uh, you know, Pharma, which uh, uh, is, a, is an epilepsy treatment, right? That's a medical product. So unlike alcohol, unlike nutraceutical, unlike consumer product, cannabinoid can be infused in just about anything in the grocery store. So I think you have a wide variety of regulations that set in 
across the uh, product platform. So we're all talking about, without saying the word, you know, government regulation. Uh, let me tell another anecdote that I'll throw at you guys. So we were talking about this earlier. Uh, I do a lot of work with the city of Los Angeles and the state of California and other things. And I happen to become friendly with some of the folks in, in Mayor Garcetti's office. And I know that there, I, I believe she's here somewhere today. Um, there's a woman who's going to be the new czar for cannabis uh, licenses in, in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and uh, I don't know if are many of you are aware, but uh, there are those who are applying for licenses to open up cafes like they have in Amsterdam, co you know, coffee shops. And uh, the city has been deluged with those requests and there's so much pent up emotion and uh, passion for doing these kinds of things in the city that the, the staff hasn't been hired yet to handle it all. And some of these people have jumped the gun and gone and started to uh, lease storefronts and they're paying for those storefronts and they can't get a license. And so there's, you know, a, a conundrum there. Um, there's different, and the city of West Hollywood apparently is the, going to be the first city who is going to allow for these cafes to, to start up. But a lot of that being said, you know, because of uh, some of the conversations I've had, again, at the state, local level, let alone federal, I don't even want to touch that right now, uh, but, you know, it's, it's very difficult if you're getting into this business to figure out what's real, what's not, what's legal, what's not. Because every area, every city, there's 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles, 88. And they all have different rules as to how they're going to deal with all this. And the state has its function. So, guys, you know, you, you're running in the world of investment. You're looking at things every day. In, in, the, in the center of all this, being in the center of all that, how do you move forward? What's your daily routine look like knowing that, depending on what city you're talking to, within the state of California, that's surrounded by a federal government who's, you know, some people believe Jeff Sessions is going to come into your bedroom and grab you in your pajamas and throw you in jail. I mean, how do you deal with that? How are you dealing with that it's from an investor perspective? State, government, local right. regulation. I mean, I'll start anyway, because I, I mean, you're asking from an investor perspective. Um, so, I, as I in my introduction, I told you I'm a, I'm a lawyer, but I also, you know, uh, I'm connecting some capital space, so also an, an investor. But from a from a legal perspective, it's really hard, to be honest. Um, people look to me as an expert, and they want you know expert answers right away. But first of all, in cannabis, even if you are an expert in just LA, there's no such thing as an easy answer. There's just it just isn't. Um, but I, um, I have clients in Michigan and Massachusetts, and so, and each law is different. Each state, these are all experiments. Every one of these things is, an ex is a statewide or citywide experiment. Uh, and, and in most places, they want the experiment to work. And they, you know, they're looking at the mistakes that other jurisdictions have made, and they're ref ref uh, reforming and refining their laws. But it's, um, it's damn near impossible to stay up on all the changes, particularly if you're not just focused on one jurisdiction. Um, if I could go back two years, I, t I talked about going, you know, being in New York for a reason, and, I, and I, like, I like the way it's worked out, but I would almost just put my, you know, uh, put it down here in, in LA and just focus on one set of rules and just know them inside and out, because uh, it's, it's really hard to, to work across multiple states. Uh, everything is, uh, just for, I'll give you one for instance, and I'll pass it on. Here in LA, uh, they give you um, dispensation for being social equity, right? So if you had a cannabis arrest or if you were, um, you know, if you're in an underprivileged area, you are in, in line for the next set of licenses. The first set of licenses went to the original 135 dispensaries and that next set is going to be for people in social equity, which I think is great. It's really for the victims of the failed war on drugs. So, so that's a good thing. But if you're, if you're in the state of Michigan and you have a, a cannabis conviction, you're out. You can't get a license. And so, I mean, you know, you, so if someone calls you on the phone and says, hey, I want to get a license in Michigan, I'm social equity, you know, well, hang on a second, you're out. You know, so it's just, it's hard. The answer is you deal with it by working 20 hours a day There's a, and, and, and still not having all the right answers. I have a follow-up question, but go ahead, guys. Uh, so, so I'll give you two points. So one is uh, 
if I'm trying to figure that out, I talk to Mitch. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you, you do need very specific market experts uh, to answer those kind of questions. But at the intersection of joke and truth is my view that, uh, that uh, every coffee shop, every restaurant, every bar is a consumption lounge today. Right? Now, it may not be uh, burning flour, uh, but vape, edibles, drinks, you know, it's, it, it already exists. Right? It's just a fact of life. Um, and I, I question, it'll be interesting to see business models that can operate um, as a consumption lounge uh, because they get restricted from alcohol or selling the product or other things. So it, it's hard to build a business around that. Uh, and again, intersection of joke and truth is um, all these venues we all go to are already consumption lounge. So I don't know that it, it, it's a great idea and I'm sure I would visit, uh, but uh, it's all around us. Yeah, I'll add, um, you know, a big part for us and for me in particular is, you know, around our due diligence is, is understanding a prospect's, uh, you know, governance, risk, and compliance program or, or what framework they're using. And, you know, regulatory compliance is not unique to the cannabis industry. It happens to be probably uh, more cumbersome than most. But, you know, I've worked in regulated industries, advised clients in both regulated and unregulated industries for the, the better part of my career. And it really comes down to the, the framework that you have in place, how flexible it is, and how responsive you are to changes in regulations. And so from an investment standpoint, do you have someone that's even thinking about that, whether internally or externally with uh, you know, an advisor that you have? And, and do you have the ability to um, align your business model with where regulations are today, but also think about how that may change, given the 88 cities in the county of LA all having different regulations, plus the states, plus, you know, international laws. So this is not unique to cannabis, but it is something that uh, operators have to think about. And, and whether you're in, you know, a non-plant touching side or plant touching side, you still have regulations. Um, so that, that's not going to go away. It's how much you consider it. And from an investor standpoint, we look at who is responsible for that in the organization. Um, do you take it seriously? And how do you respond if you do have an adverse action? So that, that's how we look at it traditionally. And um, you know, that, that's what creates opportunities too, is who can navigate that best. And you know, we've seen very large, fast growing, multi-billion dollar companies emerge in the last seven years who operated in pseudo regulated, unregulated industries and changed laws because of how they operated through their business model. So when you're looking at um, you know, wealth creation, that, that's a big factor from an investor standpoint. Yeah, I agree with that. How many people in here are involved with a cannabis business? Like actually work with one? <laughs> wow. Awesome. <laughs> okay. How many people find it confusing, this same question? Just about the, all the same people. I see Max back there, Greenflower Media, some good video on his site. But look, I mean, it's, it's, there's no simple answer, right? And um, like Evan said, it's not, in, it's not just cannabis. This is, this is every industry. And if you're a fund like ours, that invests in all different types of companies and even though we don't touch the plant do you still have concerns with uh, regulatory environments so if you're investing in a data company a media company we have bioscience companies we have a payroll company I mean they're so different right the answer is that you have to have a great team and great support so all of us have to reach out to a great lawyer, um, an expert um, in each one of these businesses. I mean, they all require their own um, experts. So if we're investing in a data company, it's a different lawyer, it's a different um, analyst and a different expert versus a media company versus a science company. So I think the real answer is just having a great team and great support to lean on for all of us. Uh, as a follow-up to that, have you seen, Mitch, uh, or do you have an opinion as to uh, which state or city that you've experienced has a better uh, plan uh, that's been actioned than others? Is there one that you like more than any other? That's a, that's a great question. Um, from an investment perspective, from a lawyer, legal perspective? Any way you want to say it. Um, you know, from an investment perspective, you know, I, I particularly, um, I like the states that are you know, the state of Michigan might come to surprise people in this room is very much like California, right? In, in cannabis, you know, it, it had a medical program, very robust medical program. Um, 
that you know you'd, you'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to see that it's going to go adult use. But right now, if you were making an investment in Michigan, you're sort of making it based on on the medical program, uh, and you're sort of getting a free option on the the fact that it's going to go wreck. It's sort of getting baked in now to the numbers because it's so obvious. But you know, six months ago or a year ago, when you when you're looking at investment deals, they were really based on medical numbers. But you know this is coming, and, and so. Um, but their program, quite honestly, is it's a mess right now. You know, emergency regulations, and no one knows what's going on there. So it's not, it's not a direct answer to your question from a legal perspective. But, but from it's one state or city that stands out. Yes, yeah. easy to work with. Um, and it's got its act together. San Francisco is pretty. They're pretty. Um, their rules are in flux right now, but they're pretty uh, amenable to working with. Uh, the constituents. I mean, again, like I said before, these are experiments. Certain cities really want these experiments to work. San Francisco is one of them. Uh, LA is one of them. Right now, they're just under re, re, understaffed and under resourced. But there's a lot. If you go look through those LA regs, it's a lot of time and thought that went into developing the program. And um, you know, it's, it'll evolve over time. But um, it's one of the more thoughtful programs. And like I mentioned before, the social equity component of it. It's a. It's. Um, Again, it's one that I'm well versed in, and, and a comment that Matt made about having a good team. My law firm, we have you know six people, and like I assign, like you are New Jersey, you know, you need to know this and whatever. So LA is what I know really well at this point in time, and uh, um, I think it's I think they're they're it's the regulations themselves are, are decently written. The enactment of the program is slow in, in rolling out just because it's just. Uh, it's going to take some time to sort it all out. Right, and there's a, a, my understanding is that there are now 30 states that have some uh, uh, approval for either medicinal or recreational or both. 20 to go. Uh, it's going yeah. to take some time. Yeah, uh, it is. But it's coming. Uh, as a, as a, uh, we're getting to the end here. I'd like to get each of you to just talk to what are the kinds of companies or industries, verticals, that you look are looking at right now that you see as highly lucrative in your opinion you know, from I, an investor perspective yeah sure I'll, I'll take it first <clears throat> so we have a lot of interest and focus on the compliance side of the industry on the advertising side of the industry um, really really you know businesses that support the underpinnings of the industry uh, they uh, they may not grow as fast as the ones that are plant touching and they may not be as flashy but they're absolutely needed and integral uh, to the industry. Compliance is the is really the underpinning. Seed to sale, uh, tracking, um, testing, uh, testing technologies, all these things that support the basics of the industry are things that are really interesting to us. And then again, on the on the advertising media side, uh, the ways that you can reach and influence the customer uh, have been of real interest to us. Yeah, I'll agree with some part, obviously, the compliance side for sure. Um, anything that is addressing the real pain points, it's even fintech right now, is, as much as there's been a lot of hype around different aspects of blockchain and Bitcoin, it, it is certainly a disruptive technology, one that can even support the compliance side of the space. So we're looking there, but you know, more broadly, Anyone that's looking to build a really strong, sustainable platform that is going to add to the level of trust and transparency in the industry right now is, is something that I'm considering and, and looking at. Um, media, we really like. High Times, not too far out from announcing some pretty big things, and I, I think that'll be interesting. Um, data, we're big on data in general. I mean, can't get enough data. Um, have, have a significant amount of data plays in this space. Um, ultimately, the uh, science, which I think drives brands. Brands are going to be massive in this industry, and, and I don't think that just is creating another strain or putting a strain into a chocolate. I think it's really driven by, you know, the technology, which is the science technology, which is who's out there playing with these cannabinoids and figuring out how to deliver them and what that means. So. I think long term, um, the science aspect and the brands are going to be amazing to watch unfold. Um, but uh, I, I think those are our three focus areas right now. Did you want me to take that as well? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I echo the sentiment. Science, I mean, that's where I started off, as I mentioned, Steep Hill Labs. And uh, I'm no longer affiliated with Steep Hill Labs. But that being said, I still believe in what they stand for. I believe in the entire lab segment. And 
What's, what you're going to see, I think, happen in California come July 1st, if that is the date that they actually stick to, uh, for when people need to, you know, product that needs to, it needs to be tested in order for it to be on shelves and, and, and consumers to buy it. It's going to be, so when I started c back 2013, the, the theory was in a legalized marketplace, all roads lead through testing. And I think what you're going to see is a significant bottleneck. And uh, it's really going to choke the, the supply chain for a bit because there's probably not enough capacity in the lab space. So I still think that that's, uh, in fact, probably now more than I would, I think I was early. I think now more than ever, it's probably uh, a good space to be looking at. Okay, well, thank you. First of all, I think we should thank all the panelists. Thank you. Um, plug 420TV, go download the app on iOS or Android or go to 420TV.com. And I'll leave you guys with this one uh, quote that comes to mind from President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, for those of you that are in the, in the industry, hearing all that you've heard here today to keep you inspired, to keep moving forward, uh, he said, take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But by all means, try something. Thank you, everybody.